Article 10 is a lengthy um, article relative to um, sewer pipe replacement, and I would entertain a motion to waive the reading of uh, all of Article 10 uh, due to its length. Uh, moved by Mr. Griffin, seconded by Mr. Bridal. Um, all those in favor of waiving the reading of Article 10 in its entirety, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards. Any opposed? Uh, Article 10 is going to be addressed by Ms. Hale from our Public Works Department, and uh, Mr. Jacobs is here as well. Uh, Ms. Hale. All right. Uh, this article is for the force main replacement that runs from Church Street uh, to our wastewater treatment plant. I think it's important to note um, a little background on why we're doing this project. Um, approximately a year ago, a uh, leak was found in the force main uh, in the middle of the marsh uh, where we had to uh, shut off one of the force mains and uh, institute a repair. What you're looking at at the screen is basically an overall view of all the area, all the sewage that enters that Church Street force main, travels across the marsh through the force mains uh, to our wastewater treatment facility. Um, on the next slide in front of you, I'm going to start a little bit of a timeline. And the timeline started in December of 2015. We were notified by DES that we were having high fecal counts uh, throughout the marsh area. They were asking if there was anything, um, you know, abnormal at the plant, our outfall that is also located in the marsh. Um, all our tests were fine. So we continued to work with them in January of 2016. Uh, we met with them, we identified areas of where we had sewage near the marsh and started increasing testing um, at areas throughout town to try to identify uh, why these counts were high. Uh, in February 2016, like I said, uh, about a year ago, uh, we got a very high hit at the bridge that crosses over Tide Mill Creek uh, off of 101 and decided we'd take a walk out on the marsh. Um, that top picture there is what we observed. Um, the force mains that go across the marsh, they're not continuous. So as they turned on and turned off, we actually saw the water rise and down, which uh, clearly indicated that we had a problem. Um, it's important to note that there's two force mains that cross over that marsh, um, and that during the summer, although it was February we found this, we do use both of them. So once we found the leak, we needed to start the process of, okay, what do we do from here? Um, we met with the selectmen, presented our options. Uh, how are we going to get there? We identified either a barge route that would take us under the bridge uh, to the location that we observed, or was it a marsh route? Um, the marsh route had its difficulties as we had two uh, tidal rivers that we needed to cross. Uh, we knew we were going to need equipment that was capable of digging in these marsh soils. Um, let's not forget that we're in a prime wetland uh, in the marsh itself, so getting there was not easy. So we weighed the force main um, options, and then we thought about what about a temporary repair. So on the next slide, these were all the things that we basically had to consider when we were doing this um, to make sure we really knew what we were doing. Uh, the fact of the matter is the ductile iron line, the line to the right, is seven and a half feet away from the asbestos cement line. Uh, the AC line is 50 years old, the ductile iron line 30 years old, and in looking at how we were going to do this repair, uh, number one priority was, well, we can't damage the one that's working. Uh, if, that, if we did or if there was a problem, we wouldn't have a way to get the flow from the pump station over to the treatment plant. We had to figure out how we were going to do this. This whole area is tidal, which gave us only small windows to do the construction. Um, we couldn't be out there while the water was at the surface. We needed it during low tide. We needed to get there. Like I mentioned, we had to get over the two uh, tidal rivers. Uh, we decided we were going to use a mat system uh, for low pressure um, traction and able to get out there and hold these machines up. And the equipment needs. I mean, we went through a whole list working through a con with a contractor. As far as an excavator dump truck, we needed bedding material generators. Um, we actually needed a septic truck to go out there and be able to um, pump off what we found out there. So on the next slide, we realized as we're talking through all this, and especially due to that seven and a half feet separation, we really needed an emergency plan to our emergency plan. What happened if, if while we were out there, um, the second force main 
uh, was damaged and what would we do? And that really brought to light uh, the emergency plan that we have implemented. And that would take putting together a fused pipe system from the pump station along 101 to the plant in an emergency situation. It's over 6,400 feet long. It would take 11 days to install. Uh, we would need to have transport in the meantime, getting any effluent from the pump station over to the treatment plant. And the cost that went along with that uh, was substantial. You're talking $100,000 just to set it up and thirteen five dollars a week um, to keep it in service uh, to make a, another or a repair. So I think it's very important to note that had this occurred during the peak flow months or our summer season, this emergency plan would have needed to be implemented. Again, it goes back to needing both of those force mains uh, to get the flow from the beach area to the treatment plant. So just a few little graphics on the next slide. These are the low pressure road mats we used. They attached, they're eight by 14. We were able to walk all the equipment out there. Uh, the excavator needed to be large enough to carry the steel supports for the bridges. The mats went over them and we basically walked our way all the way to the site. That took about three days, and on the next uh, slide, you'll see that it was the fourth day. Uh, the top picture shows the excavator over the area where we observed the leak. Uh, we were not sure whether we were over it, next to it. Uh, we were very fortunate. On the fourth day, we found uh, the, the pipe. Uh, we dug down, we had a trench box, and what you're looking at the bottom is the pipe with the hole in it and uh, what is known to be the rocks that were laying right next to it. So from there, uh, we did the repair that day. Uh, we were lucky enough that it was low tide early enough in the day. Uh, we had the pipe repaired and we walked the equipment off the site. So it really begs the question and why we're here is what do we do from here? Having that leak really brought to light uh, the importance of these force mains and the fact that Again, if this had happened in a different flow condition, it would have been a different situation. As it was, it was quite an expensive repair to get out there. Um, we don't know if there could be other rocks located in that bedding material, but it does bring the light, the age of these pipes, the inaccessibility, the inability to maintain them, um, all things we observed when we were out there on the marsh. Uh, questions have been asked is, you know, can you find the rocks? Um, ground penetrating radar is not likely to work in a salt marsh environment. We've spoken to a few people. People have asked, well, what are the lifespans of the pipes? Keep in mind, there's two pipes out there. One of them is 50 years old, one of them is 30. The concrete pipe has a lifespan of 50 to 100 years, but in this salt environment, that rapidly decreases. These pipes are reaching their lifeline. Um, we did a visual inspection of the existing pipe. They were quite full with bedding material and sediment that had sat at the bottom. And these are the low ends, and we looked in both directions. Um, they have not been maintained since they've been installed, mainly because you can't do it. Um, when I say you can't do it, uh, it leads to, well, how would we even access or maintain, maintain these pipes in the future? So on the next slide, we had to really figure out what do we do, what are our objectives, what are we trying to aim by taking these pipes out of the marsh? Well, mainly, if we ever have another break, we need to be aware that this really has an effect on the marsh environment and uh, the shellfish and fishing industry that's right there, as well as our clean waters. Again, the maintenance and access. We do not have maintenance and access to these pipes now. Due to the overall length, it's over almost 4,000 feet from A to B, we can't get in there and do typical cleaning and uh, maintenance as you would on a standard force main like we do throughout town. Well, we do that on our gravity mains. We cannot do it on this force main. And then while we're at it, we need to look at the future growth and know that if we did have one go offline and it did happen during the summer, that we could handle the flows. So what were our options? We went along and looked and said, okay, what can we do? We worked with our consultants. And on the next slide, basically, we weighed out, we can do some continued investigation. Uh, the continued investigation meant cleaning and accessing these pipes. To do it, we would actually have to break the pipes to get in there to clean the pipes and able to inspect the pipes. You'd have to do this in four different locations and based on the cost we just did to get out there, 
It just, it, it's not something that went to the top of the priority list when we know we have other reasons that this needs to be done. Uh, we looked at replacing the pipes in the marsh. There's pipe bursting, pipe lining, directional drilling. Again, that would have given us new pipes, but it did not solve the problem of access and maintenance and future sustainability uh, of these pipes and us being able to get there and maintain them. So the, after weighing these options and the costs, uh, we looked at the Route 101 replacement. You know, it, it all comes down to the replacement of these force mains. What is the consequence if we have another failure? Um, this was something that was taken um, from um, one of the NRDC annual reports. Hampton Beach is one of the 13 superstar beaches in the United States. It's one of the safest in the nation to swim at because of the cleanliness of the water. Um, breaks in our force mains in our marshes that lead to our water affect this. A failure during that peak summer flow again uh, makes us institute the emergency plan. We need it for capacity. From there, we look at Hampton Beach restrictions as far as water usage. We look at shellfish and fishing restrictions, not able to open the beds. Um, not only is that a loss of revenue to those that work that industry, but a loss of revenue to those that work and live down in the town uh, beach. That is both the town revenue and state revenue, keeping in mind the state beach is down there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a significant cost putting in that temporary force main. And let's not forget about the quote at the top. There's a reputation component that can't be quantified. Um, if our beaches are, we've worked this hard to get them known to be uh, about their cleanliness, what is it going to take to come back there? So the last slide here is the proposal. It's the proposal uh, for the Church Street force main replacement. We will be putting in two 16-inch. SDR, 17 force main pipes. Basically, it's a fused pipe that goes underground. It will go from the pump station along the west side shoulder of Route 101. It will not go under the creek. Uh, we are building a utility bridge. A bridge. Again, it's to keep it so it's accessible. Uh, it will cross along the bottom to Tide Mill and then back into the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the cost of this project is the 4.242000, uh, so 4.242 million. And that is for all the work associated and the materials to get this online. All right, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Sullivan, would you like to be heard? This is also, as I understand it, Ms. Hale, it's a bond article, so it's a three-fifths uh, three vote required for passage. William Sullivan, 12 Colonial Circle. Um, I don't know how many saw the article in the Portsmouth Herald last this past week about the town of Kittery when they lost a sewer main coming out of the Navy Yard, and it put a business, it put a store out of business for an estimated two months. And I couldn't help but think if we had another failure of the force main coming from our industrial park. I call Hampton Beach our industrial park because that is a large portion of our tax base. And if we lose that main again, if we lose it in the summertime especially, uh, you'd have to shut the beach down completely. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I know there's a lot of amateur engineers around that say we do or do not need uh, this project, I, I will go with Chris and Jen from our Public Works Department, who I have a lot of respect for, and uh, their their staff is saying this has got to be done, and I agree. Um, I'm not going to get up again on the next article because it's the same thing. We've got to spend money on sewers this year. The Lafayette Road uh, sewer in the next article is just as important as this one, but I hope everybody in town will turn out in March and vote in favor of this project. It's very expensive. But too many cities and towns wait until they have an actual emergency before they do anything about it. And I think this is the year to take care of that, uh, those two sewer projects. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Nyan. Good morning. John Nyan, 2 Walnut Avenue. Uh, 
in speaking to this warrant article, I'm representing the Hampton Beach Area Commission. Uh, and first of all, I want to commend um, both Chris and Jennifer on a, a job well done in terms of the presentation, uh, the explanation of, of this warrant article. Last Thursday night, the Hampton Beach Area Commission took a uh, vote and it was unanim unanimously voted to support this warrant article. Uh, we in Hampton uh, talk a lot about the two mile, the two miracle mile. Uh, this is uh, impacting um, one of those miles and the, uh, the Beach Commission felt that it's, it's really, really important, probably one of the most important articles uh, uh, to be heard uh, today and voted on in March. So the Beach Commission is in full support of this warrant article. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Nyan. Um, Mr. Tilton. I'm just going to ask a question for the board historically. When did we do the sewer upgrade at the, at the beach? Um, what year was that? Did we, anyone recall? You talk about the beach infrastructure? Yeah. Oh, that was uh, 2004, 2005. Okay. So we replaced sewer lines, up, up, yeah, upgraded um, the lines at the, the main And beach. then we replaced the pump station at Church Street yeah. two years ago. Okay. So this, could I characterize this as sort of the, the last piece of the puzzle of that? Um, would that be fair? Or are there other pieces, Mr. Jacobs, before I get to Mr. Tilton? Okay. It's okay. Uh, no, it's, it, they're not the, the last pieces. Okay. Uh, understand this is an ongoing um, situation for the town. We have literally like 8,000 feet of 8-inch clay sewer line throughout the town. So, Yeah, but just focusing on the beach, we, we've done the main beach, we did the pump station, this is the crossing to the treatment plant, are there other pieces in between that? There's other, there's more work to be done down there. Okay, beach. okay, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Tilton, go That's ahead. Okay. Peter Tilton, Jun <coughs> Peter Tilton Jr., uh, 125 Landing Road. Uh, five-star beach is what we've got because of its clean water. It's been rated this way by various entities as one of the top ten beaches nationally. Nationally. Uh, I just had took advantage of a clip on the HamptonBeach.org website this morning with an NBC story that mentioned Hampton Beach as a top five beach, top ten beach. That's great publicity and it's free. We've earned it though. We've paid a lot to get the free publicity. December of 2015, one of the force mains under the marsh failed. I know this because DES started noting huge unsafe bacteria counts in the estuary and closed the clam flats. And I noticed when they closed the clam flats because my business uh, depends on uh, somewhat on people coming back from clamming and buying lobsters on their way back home to Manchester or Rochester or whatever. And this problem was noted in December, but it wasn't actually located for two months. It wasn't easy to find because of the location of the pipes. Um, and even after the repair was made, it was another two months before DES determined the estuary was clean enough to harvest shellfish in. This all happened in cold weather when people weren't swimming, so it wasn't noticed by a great many people. Imagine, if you will, if the pipe failed in early July, it could be three days before DPW noticed a spike in the bacteria counts during their twice a week sampling, and then more time before the actual break would be found. Days of untreated human waste flowing into the harbor and along the beach in early July. Do you think the news coverage and social media would ignore this? Many of us have had a big laugh at the scene in the movie Caddyshack when someone finds a candy bar in a swimming pool and panic ensues. It won't be funny when kids start picking up unidentified floating objects along our no longer five-star beach. They won't be baby roof bars. Some people will say this project can be put off because we aren't sure this will happen again or when. It's unlikely, any, it's unlikely any one of us will suffer a major damage to our homes on any given day, but it doesn't stop most of us from paying homeowners insurance in case it happens. Fixing, fixing this time bomb of a problem is insurance for the town that we don't irreparably damage the reputation of cleanliness of Hampton Beach enjoys. 
No amount of advertising money can buy that back once it's lost. Vote yes on this article. Only a nearsighted ostrich would fail to see what is coming if we ignore this. Thank you, Mr. Tilton. Mr. Rage. Chuck Rage, 121 Ocean Boulevard. Um, speaking on behalf of the Hampton Beach Village District. I think that the town hires professional people and the reason we have them here is to give us advice. And I think Jennifer and Chris are the experts in this field for the town and we need to listen to them. One of the key components is the summer months at the beach. We all know that. If something like this goes down and the beach is down, it affects the beach, it affects the town, it affects the state. We need to move forward. We need to uh, react. We, we need to uh, be. Um, we need to do this now, as we. Uh, the cost of money right now is is the best it's ever going to be, and we all are watching the stock market and seeing what's going on. I feel that if we wait, it's going to cost us a lot more money, not just for the for the actual. Um, project, but actual money that we're going to spend on interest. So I really think we need to move forward now with this to save the town and the disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Age. Mr. Zanoy. Uh, Jerry Zanoy, 16th Presidential Circle in Hampton. <laughs> one bothers me because I think a real crucial step was skipped. 50 years we've had a pipe in the marsh, 50 years on one and 30 on the other. We had, a, we had bacteria, waste, leak, discovered in December, identified in February, fixed in March, 180,000. Beautiful job fixing it. Quite a technology to do it. Um, I went down to the Church Street pump station to look at the pipe in detail, look at the rock in detail. I lifted the rock and it was very heavy. It was granite, bedrock material, I believe, but it was so covered with crud I couldn't really. But it was this big, very heavy. It wasn't placed there by any contractor. In my opinion, it probably broke off of the bedrock and he wrote it up through and hit the pipe. So then I look at the pipe. It's a concrete lined pipe, polyethylene, polyethylene coating wrap. Uh, good pipe. I did not see appreciable wear. Most of the pipes that leak in the United States are due to corrosion not because of this kind of a happening. So, okay. So, what, what I would do from there, what I would, I would evaluate my current pipes. I've been in the field of product assurance for, four, for 50 years. So I do a lot of defect analysis and corrective action on all kinds of products. Project Apollo, right up through uh, today's aircraft instrumentation and the F-35 and the F-22. This is not high tech to me. Because as part as a director's job, you've got to answer defects from the Army, the Navy, wherever. And your feet are held to the fire. Um, they want to know root cause of the defect. They want to know the correction you made with respect to the defect, and they want to know what you're going to do in the future to correct the system that caused this. And they look at the answers and they bounce them back if they're not happy and, you know, the whole scenario similar to DES. And I've worked with DES in, in uh, 10, 9, uh, in 10 and 11. In thinking about it, and looking online, you can learn everything you want online. You can go to college and graduate online. Mrs. Zanoy, I need you to bring it into the article, okay? 
So what would I have done? I would have done a rock field survey to see what rocks are in this marsh, if any, either through sonar or airborne radar. I would have taken soil samples and sent them to the lab. It was a 10-point system of measuring soil. Resistivity, pH, redox potential, sulfides, and moisture. If you come to 10 points or more, you get soil that is considered corrosive. I would have sent this pipe, or pictures of it, to the Iron Pipe Institute, and I would have asked what they think of my wear and what would be their projections of longevity? And they'll give you an answer. I would evacuate or excavate down to the 50-year-old pipe to see what my condition was and geologically get in there and look at it very carefully because it is asbestos concrete embedded pipe. Pipes, by the way, last 100 years and more under general conditions, 150 in some cases. And then I would have done camera scans, a little sample here and there of camera scans inside the pipe to see if what I have for blockages and linings and so on. Now with that body of knowledge, I'd be willing to say something to the public and to my government or whoever else. And if I didn't see any risks or even moderate risks, and I'm still in the low risk scale, we've had risks for 50 years. Those pipes were put in, those risks were there. It's the shortest distance from the Church Street pump station to the transfer uh, to the wastewater plant. That's why they ran that way, as opposed to up 101. I like the 101 route if it's required. I would have tied me. And I said that in March and April of this year. I said it again just a few weeks ago. I heard everything that Jennifer said. I listened carefully. We don't have any blockages. This is not a gravity fed. This is a force fed line, two lines, 15 pounds per square inch issue, roughly speaking. Why should I have blockages? We didn't, I didn't see, matter of fact, in that pipe that I saw that was taken away, the concrete liner was perfect, practically. No striations, no grooves, no digs, no attacks of sulfide gas, which you'll find in these pipes if you have that condition. And it had the polyphylene wrap on it. And after 30 years, it did show, I don't know if this was the damage upon taking out or it did show uh, some, some age. But age does not cause leaks. Corrosion costs leaks. That's what we gotta aim at. So, these pipes have never been listed on any priority list. And what happens if we didn't have a break? What do we do then? Well, we're gonna replace pipes, well for what? That would be our first thing. But we had a break caused by a rock, an isolated random defect. Nobody put that there. They would have to be violating the specifications of laying pipes, which is online. All right, Frank, so Mr. Zanoy, so Mrs. Zanoy, I'm going to jump in. I got two people behind you who need to okay. be heard. My understanding is of your comments is that you feel that okay, further. Okay, now I, I would like to make a motion on this article. Okay. Okay. Yep. Article 10, you're asking for 4242000 I want to make that zero. Okay, is there a second? I don't spend Mr. money is there uh, unnecessarily. No, let me continue, please. Is there a second to Mr. Zanoy's motion to amend Article 10 by deleting 4242000 and replacing it with zero? Stand up, please. Mr. Pierce, seconds? Okay. All right, so uh, we I have other things on that article too. No, I've given you a lot of time. So I've got a motion on the floor. I'm going to ask Mr. Kravitz if he wishes to speak to the motion to zero out Article 10. And if you don't, that's fine. And then I've got Mr. Jacobs and then Mr. Jones. Mr. Jacobs is yielding to Mr. Jones. You wish to speak to the Zanoy Amendment. Mr. Zanoy, you need to yield the podium to yep. Mr. Jones. Jones. Sure. Oh, would you take your materials, please? <laughs> You'll to take my materials. Yep. Yeah, I don't Go ahead. It's my understanding. That Hold on. Let's let's make sure we get Mr. Jones's remarks over the uh, airways. So, Mr. Jones or Mr. Zanoy, could you tighten the microphone so that it uh, catches the speaker's uh, remarks? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zanoy. 
it's, it's my understanding that the state has ordered this work to be done. So obviously we need to come up with the money to do the work. Well, the state will come up with the money for us. Do we have a choice in the matter? We've been under order here. We're under order to vote for this, aren't we? Where's the choice? I, mean, I don't mean vote for this amendment. I mean, we're under order to fund it. Now, you're either going to follow orders or you're not. Thank you, Mr. Z Jones. Uh, do you want to speak, Mr. Kravitz, to the Zanoy amendment, which is... Okay. This is Sonny Kravitz, eight cents here. Doesn't make any sense to me to zero out the, the war and The state said it, it, the, it, the problem has to be solved by the December of this year. It's a bond issue, and it requires a three-fifths vote. So it's critical that the town resolves this problem. The only question I had is, when it cro goes across the creek, it's not going to be buried the pipeline. Correct. Is there any possibility that we might freeze in a situation? No, we are working. Uh, Ms. Uh, Hale, if you could come to the microphone. So Mr. Kravitz asked uh, Ms. Hale about whether the pipe was going to be um, buried, and I believe the answer was no. Uh, and then Mr. Kravitz followed up and asked whether there was a risk of freeze. Uh, and Mr. Jacobs, your response. Uh, the engineers have determined the only way the water could freeze, given the design we have, is it'd have to be negative 21 for 67 hours running. Okay. Um, my answer to that was we have other issues if it's negative 21 for 67 hours. But in the short, I can also put electrical lines in there to keep it from freezing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Kravitz, on the Zanoy yeah. amendment? The, all I wanted to emphasize is that this is a critical solution to the problem. If, but because it requires a thrift of vote, the residents have to vote over one for it. Right. Thank you, Mr. Kravitz. All right, anyone else wishing to be heard on the Zanoy Amendment? And if not, we will uh, take a vote on the Zanoy Amendment. All right, uh, all those in favor of the Zanoy Amendment, which is to zero out the uh, appropriated appropriation sought, Four million two hundred forty-two thousand, and replace it with a zero. You'll raise your voter card if you are in favor of a zero. All those in favor, raise your voter card. All those opposed, down cards. I declare the Zanoy amendment has failed. Anyone else wishing to be heard on the? Uh, on the article as it's been presented. Now, you've already spoken, so I want to see if there's anybody else. And Mr. Jacobs, uh, if you could yield, no, he's, uh, he's helping me. Is there anyone else um, wishing to be heard on Article 10? Okay. I'm going to, uh, unless you have something new, Mr. Zanoy, I think you expressed clearly to, uh, to those of us your due diligence, your work, your assessment. Um, and other than the money. Money's been no, no, I'm gonna, I think we got the flavor of, of you're opposed to it and the reasons you're opposed to it. So if I don't see anyone new who's going to be heard on Article uh, 10, I'm